for those of you who are not aware of it or weren't around when uh, Pat Griffiths mentioned it this morning, in addition to my Shubin Cafe journalism mode, I'm also engineer in charge of the Metropolitan Opera Live in HD in 1700 cinemas worldwide. And I will be happy to answer any questions that you have about the Met that are either technical or stuff that has been publicly released. Okay, um, let's start out. What is alternative content? We're calling this session alternative content for cinema. And, well, cinema is the place where people pay to see movies. Content is what's on the screen in that place. And the alternative is non-movies, except sometimes it's movies too. <laughs> so here's a little bit more about what it is. There's sports, um, generally sports that we're not too wild about watching on television, uh, motocross or something like that. There's stage entertainment. Opera is the number one alternative content worldwide, and I'll get into why that might be later. Uh, there's theater, national theater. Uh, the UK has wonderful series. Uh, the Nutcracker Live, ballet, there's lots of ballet. There's radio shows, radio shows and cinemas, but yep, Prairie Home Companion, uh, Glenn Beck, uh, Bill O'Reilly, they've all been as alternative content in cinemas. There's politics and economics, um, gaming, we'll hear more about that later from Patrick. Um, art exhibitions, there was an art exhibition at the National Gallery in London called Leonardo and uh, that became an alternative content presentation called Leonardo Live, and it had fantastic sales. There's religious services. There's churches that do things. There's talks, the New York Times Times Talk series. There's more genres. There's other con concerts besides uh, classical music. There's rock. There's um, that thing that's kind of blue and hard to read is St. Olaf's College Christmas event. And that's gotten very good numbers. Countdown, which is marching bands competition. There's charity events. That uh, pink thing is the Susan Komen Foundation. Documentary uh, about the history of the marathon. TV shows, a discussion of Lost. And then, as I mentioned, movies. Uh, one thing you may remember from Mystery Science Theater 3000, that's now become Rift Tracks and Rift Tracks Live. You can go to a theater, watch a really, really bad movie with people making really, really good jokes about it. Uh, the Twilight series, when they come out with a new movie, they sometimes do one of the old ones as an event. Uh, the Sound of Music, 45th anniversary, that was an event. The key to all of these things is that they're events. The idea, by the way, for this happened before cinema. This is actual reproduced article that appeared in The Sun in New York on Friday, March 30th, 1877. And if you can't read it, it says, both telephone and electroscope, which was some form of television, applied on a large scale, would render it possible to represent at one time on a 100 stages in various parts of the world the opera or play sung or acted in any given theater. And here's some of the history. I've got the technology history on the left. I've got the programming history on the right. Uh, this stuff is available. If you go to my website, shubincafe.com, you'll find high-resolution res high versions of these various things. But you can see that as early as 1927, people were already looking at large screen um, television systems. The image at the bottom left there from 1935, you can see the chair. Uh, it gives you an idea of the size of the screen. That was a self-luminous screen, by the way. The 1936 Olympics were shown as alternative content in various theaters. Uh, the first Major League Baseball presentation was in 1941, although the first sanctioned one was in 1949. Um, carpet and opera, I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a moment. Here is the marquee of the Orpheum Theater. The marquee still exists. Those of you who are from Los Angeles might remember it. And uh, there you can see on the marquee those heavenly carpets by Lees, and then in the middle it says the opera Carmen is going to be shown. This uh, picture was shot in December 1952. It appeared in Life magazine in January 1953. The carpet and the opera were both done by the leading alternative cinema company of the time, although at that time it was called Theater Television, so the company was Theater Network Television. And then down below are movies that the cinema was showing. So it's not a new idea. 
Here's an RCA demo at the NAB show in 1947. And then at the right, I have a book that came out in 1925 by Archibald Montgomery Lowe, uh, who, by the way, predicted the cell phone and many other things. And he says, here people are going to watch television races in Australia in a cinema in London. But there was community demand, and this goes back way, way before what I'm even showing here. Now, the interesting thing on the left, that's the 1912 World Series. And there's a big crowd, except that crowd is in Washington, D.C. The series was between Boston and New York. So why is that big crowd gathering in Washington? Well, they're gathering to see the upper left inset, which is a scoreboard that was getting telegraphic messages and posting what was happening in the game. That got converted into theatrical systems. The first one was actually in 1884. Um, there were all kinds. There were kinds with mannequins going around, animatronics uh, in the 19th century. This particular one is 1924 at the National Theater in Washington. Five operators. One of them was the telegraph operator. The others operated this light board, and then people would sit in the theater and watch the ball game. It was the only way you could watch remote games on tele before there was television. Uh, and they paid money. They paid like 25 cents. And movies at the time were five cents. So you can get more money for alternative content. Now, quick look at movies versus alternative content. Movies are movies. Alternative content can be anything. Movies have, have continuous showings. Alternative content generally one time, sometimes encore, sometimes a week. Chris was saying maybe you can have a three-week thing. But it's always an event. But that means movies have lifetime grosses uh, and a long tail and things that can happen beyond cinema, as Chris was talking about. And there's always a profit motive. You've got to make money. Well, in alternative content, there's advanced sales, which is nice. Sometimes um, half the tickets will be sold a year in advance from when the event is announced. The prices can be hired, higher, but the numbers are very different. But no profit is maybe OK. Maybe you don't have to make money on alternative cinema. And I'll explain that a little bit. Uh, movies have movie advertising. Alternative cinema has a built-in fan base. And the advertising can be very different from even the stuff that Chris was talking about. Chris was saying, well, you use social media. I ran into the uh, Swedish distributor for the Metropolitan Opera Cinemacast. We are in uh, 86 cinemas in Sweden. And he did his first one. His fingers were crossed. He didn't know how many people would show up. He did lots of social media advertising. And sure enough, there was this big, long line of older women who he didn't think would be using the social media that much. So he approached one of them and said, excuse me, but um, how did you find out about this? And she looked at him like this must be his first day at the planet. And she said, it was on the radio. <laughs> Um, movies are never live, alternative content often live. Movies have known car characteristics. Alternative content, non-standard in every form. Different cinemas use different receivers, different projection systems. Frequently they're on the pre-show ad projectors, which are basically PowerPoint projectors. They're not digital cinema projectors. So what you see at the far right is something that was actually sent into the Metropolitan Opera by an actual listener, an actual viewer, who said, um, hey, this is what it's supposed to look like. And he did a Macbeth chart and photoshopped it and said, and this is what it looked like in the cinema. Fix it. So a little bit about the different numbers. Uh, this season, the Metropolitan Opera's Satya Graha uh, grossed $1 million in North America, according to Variety. That was the lowest gross of this season. Uh, the 2001 season. It had minimalist music, which a lot of people don't like, by Philip Glass. It had a minimalist set. It was sung entirely in Sanskrit, and there were no subtitles. But that didn't matter because the words had nothing to do with the opera. But nonetheless, this one, that was the worst of the season, tied for number 11 that weekend. Number 11 in weekend theatrical box office gross. That's one showing of an opera versus three days of continuous movies. So it sounds, wow, this is pretty good stuff. But let's look at the numbers a little bit differently. So there's the same Satyagraha, 1 million in North America, tied for 11 that weekend, tied for 210 that year. Because there was only about 50,000 audience, 
And that's not a lot. And after that one showing, poof, there wasn't anything. Il Trovatore, which was one of the best of the 2011 season, uh, grossed 2.5 million in North America for the weekend, would have been number 10 that weekend, but number 176 that year. And that's with 125,000 uh, audience. Still, you know, respectable, but not huge. Uh, La Boheme, when the Metropolitan Opera put it on, on PBS, on television, that was an audience of 18 million. Uh, but the cinema casts provide exposure. They get sponsors. Bloomberg sponsors the um, Met cinema casts worldwide. They get donations. We have different sponsors actually for different countries in some cases. Uh, builds up a distant audience. It was called a new art form by the Los Angeles Times. Has won Peabody Awards. Won an Emmy, which is a strange thing because it's not television. Um, but all of that is stuff that can make an institution happy. And if they don't lose money, that's not necessarily so bad. By the way, I don't have the numbers for yesterday's La Traviata, but it had the highest advanced sales of the season. But last Saturday, a week ago, uh, we did Manon. That finished eighth in U.S. weekend theatrical box office gross. How do the exhibitors feel about it? They love it. They fill up at an early hour. They sell out in many cases. Uh, for Traviata, uh, we got a report from a cinema in Florida, a multiplex, a suburban multiplex, no uh, major location. Um, they filled three of their multiplex screens for uh, La Traviata. Concessions. If you start a six-hour opera at 9 a.m. on the West Coast, you're going to sell a lot of concessions. So here's a guy coming up with his popcorn. You can see somebody else with popcorn. That's at a screening of Magic Flute. Advanced sale, another wonderful thing. But there's projection issues, especially early on. We would have somebody sell out a 200-seat auditorium, and they'd go, oh, my God, we got to go into the 500-seat auditorium. And they would take the projector from the 200-seat auditorium and move it into the 500-seat auditorium, and so the screen would be a quarter as bright. Or we had another one. Sold out one auditorium, say, great, we got to open up another auditorium. And they sold out the second auditorium. And then they called us because they didn't have any picture in the second auditorium. And so we tried to help them and said, okay, you know, what kind of connection do you have? Connection? <laughs> but live stuff is very tricky. Now, why do we do live? Because uh, we get better numbers for the live. Live always draws better than the encores. Um, we have to do lip sync testing. And we use a clapstick because we're not dealing with engineers in the cinemas. We're dealing with projectionists who, if we're lucky, have a chance to look through the little window for a minute. Um, and so they know what a clapstick is supposed to be. They don't know anything else. The connections and equipment I mentioned. The projectionist is very busy but has to select the feed and the language. Uh, we've had English cinemas with Deutsch. We've had Deutsch cinemas with English. Um, there's weather issues. There's someone brushing the snow out of a dish above our cinema in Erie, Pennsylvania. There's a sound level issue if it's uh, pre-show. Uh, there's an end of event uh, issue. The projectionist doesn't know when the event's going to end because we don't know when the event's going to end. There could be encores. There could be um, conductor going faster or slower. So this is the last 10 minutes of every Metropolitan Opera transmission. And why is it this white screen? So that we can provide exit lighting. Because we've had people in a dark cinema tripping down the stairs with no one turning on the lights. So we turn on the lights for them for 10 minutes. <laughs> so why opera? Why is opera the number one alternative content worldwide? Well, for one thing, there's a tremendous repertoire of events. At the Metropolitan Opera, they do 28 different operas every season. So they can chug out an awful lot of alternative content. Uh, there are thousands of different operas that have been written. There's global appeal, and it doesn't matter what the language is. People often go to operas that are not in a language that they understand. There's a strong fan base. That little uh, picture that I have next to the strong fan base, that's a uh, road accident that happened in Connecticut. An SUV rolled over several times. The fire department showed up. They rescued the people out of it. Uh, the ambulance showed up, and the people bypassed the ambulance and started walking very fast. And they said, where are you going? Don't you want to be checked out? No, we don't want to miss the opera. 
It's got a long media history. Opera has been involved with the media, believe it or not, since the um, 17th century. Uh, I can tell you about that some other time, or you can look up my Library of Congress lecture about it. But radio, satellite radio, PBS, uh, there's magazines, so there's lots of media about it. Uh, there, by the way, is a 17th century uh, system for uh, sending opera outside the house using acoustic ducts. It's also a big budget institution, and you do need a bunch of money, as Chris mentioned. This is not a cheap thing. Somebody's got to fund it. Uh, down at the bottom there, you see every legal parking space on three New York City blocks being taken up by the Metropolitan Opera's trucks. Um, but I have a question about that, which is, well, if all of these things are true and necessary, what about sports? Sports has all that. Football, basketball, baseball should all be doing that, and maybe Elizabeth can tell us something about that later. But is it a flash in the pan? Here's something that happened at a SIMTI conference in 1948. Uh, television pictures and theaters will initially at least have the strong appeal of novelty. Uh, all I can tell you is the Met just finished its sixth season of uh, 12 cinema casts per season and is starting the seventh season in September uh, with another 12 cinema casts. This, by the way, was the cinema cast of 1952 that I showed you the picture of before. Anybody have any idea what's playing at this cinema? I think it's Carmen. Here is 2007. Uh, we did at least get billing above Alpha Dog. <laughs> so let's compare 55 year history from 1952 to 2007. Uh, 1952 Carmen, black and white, low definition, worse than AM radio quality sound, just four cameras in fixed positions. They had to negotiate with television networks to use the coax. So TV stations had to drop their network feeds in order for it to be seen. 31 cinemas in 27 cities, but still sold more than 60,000 seats. Not bad. And a $60 top in 2007 dollars, but that was considered an insignificant gross in 1952 because everyone went to the movies. And if you didn't fill up the 5,000 seats in a movie palace, you didn't do a good job. 90-minute walk-in. 2007, color, HD, subtitles, digital surround sound, 15 cameras moving around, satellite delivery, more than 600 screens at the time, uh, global. Uh, but with 20 times the number of screens, we only sold like one and a half times the number of seats, 1.6 times, 97,000 seats. And a $22 top in uh, 2007 dollars. It was the 11th highest weekend gross, 45 minute walk in. Uh, but in all three cases, the house, the union, the box office were all concerned. This is going to be a problem for us. The cinema audience in both cases applauded, and the quality perception was very high in both cases. Um, so why is this? Well, we look at the cinema admissions. Again, 1952, 2.7 billion admissions. 2007, 1.4 billion. It's gotten even worse than that. The U.S. population. 157.6 million in 1952, 301 million in 2007. So the population doubled, cinema admissions halved. It's a different environment. But now why this uh, feeling that it was good even in 1952? It's the group mentality. If you're in a room with a whole bunch of people and they're accepting it, you're going to accept it. And that's why there's applause. Uh, because you're with a group and the group likes it, the group wants to applause. There's also this cognitive dissonance. If you spent a bunch of money and you had to go someplace away from home and you had to devote a bunch of time to getting there, maybe hire a babysitter and so on, then if you didn't like the opera, you were stupid. And you don't want to be stupid. So your quality perception goes up because of what you had to do to go there. Um, but now, uh, the equipment is in place, as Chris said, or is getting in place. The distribution is much easier. You no longer have to negotiate with the TV stations. But there are alternative venues for the alternative content. There's home theater. There's arenas and stadiums. There's arts centers. There's opera at the ballpark at AT&T Park uh, that San Francisco Opera goes to. So quick introduction of the panel. We're going to start at the content end with Elizabeth Scott, then production and transmission facilities, Lenny Laxer, uh, distribution, Bob Fiorella, uh, exhibition and gaming. There's a bunch of overlap between those guys, Patrick Leon. And then something that you guys 
don't have in anything other than alternative content what I call a super viewer, uh, Barbara Mortensen. So a little bit about Elizabeth. She's the chief media and digital officer of Lincoln Center for the Performing Arts. Uh, I said there's about 40 performance venues. She wants me to point out that the official number is 29, although they perform in some other places. Uh, and they present hundreds of different performances a year. They could do a different alternative content every day and never repeat themselves. And she's got experience in other areas. She was the executive producer for Major League Baseball on the Academy Award nominee Moneyball and was vice president of programming for Major League Baseball properties. Uh, Lenny is vice president of All Mobile Video, which provides the production facilities, including multi-language subtitling and frame rate conversion and the transmission facilities. And he's the guy on the phone during the opera shows. And he does many things besides the Met Opera and alternative content. Bob Fiorella, uh, chief operating officer of Cinedimes Entertainment Group. Um, he's involved in uh, the live 3D stuff, the children's programming that you heard about before. Patrick Leon, senior manager, sorry, senior manager of Sony uh, Digital Cinema Services. Uh, he launched the PlayStation Cinema Gaming, and there you see a picture of it in a cinema, and he'll talk a little bit more about that later. And then Barbara, this strange category that we don't have in anything else, a super viewer. She's known as the opera lady. Sorry? Strange lady. Strange lady, yes. <laughs> She's known as um, the opera lady in her area, which is Palm Springs. She arranges for content that she wants to see. She negotiates with the exhibitors and the distributors and says, this is what I want to get to my place. But then what she does in return is she fills up the cinemas. Uh, the Met did an opera this year called The Enchanted Island, brand new opera, a Baroque pastiche with countertenors, not everyone's cup of tea, wasn't the worst thing, it wasn't sung in Sanskrit, um, but it did not do very well, it was probably the next to the worst of the uh, cinemas, and yet in Barbara's cinemas she sold out, there were people turned away. Um, so quite an extraordinary thing, and uh, I will now turn things over to Elizabeth and uh, then we'll have a panel discussion. So, Elizabeth.